Good morning to everyone that's here in the sanctuary with me and also to those who are at home watching us on Facebook Live. And if there's anyone who doesn't know who I am, I'm a child of God and I'm the administrator here at Unity of Springfield and I'm a licensed Unity teacher. Now I've had an idea percolating in my mind for months about what I would speak on the next time that I did the talk. And I've been asked several times and I would either say yes and then I'd renege at the last minute or I would say no, it just wasn't the right time or I didn't feel good or who knows what. And then I was listening to Sue two weeks ago and I don't know if it was in her meditation or her talk but a whole new idea came to me, and you have to pay attention to those. It had reawakened in me the divine guidance, the ideas I had followed, and the picture of things working out that looked like they didn't have a chance, that all odds were against being ever able to call it good. Reverends Richard and Mary Alice Jafala, Well, I turned it on. No, I turned it off. There. They wrote in the quest, A Journey for Spiritual Rediscovery. You will draw closer to your inner sense of guidance, which will never fail to direct you in ways that will protect you, prosper you, heal you, and lift you. The reason you can follow this guidance with positive assurance is that it comes from your own Christ essence from within you. And it's always working on your behalf. Although inner guidance may announce itself through the intellect, it operates through the heart, through your feelings. It comes to you not as a logical, calculated decision, but more as an insight, a feeling. It always has a sense of rightness and joy. Perhaps you haven't been into listening, been into the habit of listening for or to this kind of inner guidance. Ironically, it takes practice to regain a process which should come naturally to us, but which we probably somehow lost as children. When I first came to Unity, I was all but kicking and screaming. My therapist recommended that I start going to Unity, and I had a good friend that went to Unity. And she convinced me, Susan, my friend, convinced me that I should go with her. Now, I had been an Episcopalian since I was 11 years old. My family, my mother and dad, and my little sister and I joined when I was about 11 at All Saints Episcopal Church in Miami, Oklahoma. We joined as a family. And I met my husband in youth group there. We married and raised our four children in the Episcopal Church. And I had been attending the church, Episcopal Church, in Overland Park, but I just didn't fit in. As a divorcee, it was a very family-orientated church, and I, I just didn't have a place, a niche for me. So I started out in the last row at Unity Church of Ovalon Park, also called UCOP. I cried every Sunday. I left with puffy eyes and a soggy Kleenex. But I moved forward one row at a time about every week or so, and still crying every, every time I moved. It wasn't long before I took my first Unity Basics 1 class. And in that class, you had to stand up and give your name and state why you were taking the class. Well, I stood up and nothing came out but a croak. I couldn't even say my own name out loud. I was so scared. 
I began to immerse myself in classes offered there at the church, and it seemed like if the doors were unlocked, I was there. And I began to facilitate some classes and to volunteer. I began to attend Unity in about 1988, which I think is the same year or approximately that Sue started here uh, going to Unity. In about 1993 or 94, I found myself attending CEP, Continuing Education Program at Unity Village. I just knew I was supposed to be there. I had no intention of ever becoming a licensed Unity teacher, but I had felt that nudge, which I didn't know at the time was probably divine guidance. And living close to Unity Village in 15 months, I had completed all of the classes that I needed. And I graduated in the fall of 1995. I did my uh, skills demonstration seminar in the spring of 96. And I graduated in 95. And I had become a licensed Unity teacher in 96, in April. In March of 1998, I interviewed to be in, put into the ministerial program at the village. On Thursday of that same week, I came to Springfield because my second son, Matt, was getting married. And I asked my friend, Reverend Paul Hasselbeck, to check my mail and if my letter came to open it and call me. Well, Thursday evening, I was having dinner with my son and his bride, his father, and I was meeting her parents for the very first time. Right before I left the hotel, Paul called and read me the letter of redirection. Now, redirection means you did get in, but that's their nice way of putting it. That's a positive way of putting it, <laughs> that you were not chosen. So Friday, the whole day, you know, with the wedding going on, was filled, and we had a rehearsal dinner that night, and Saturday, all kinds of festivities Saturday evening was the wedding and the reception. So on Sunday morning, I headed back to Overland Park. Just north of Springfield, I said, well, okay, God. I thought that's what you wanted me to do, but evidently not. So what do you want me to do now? Instantly, I heard a booming voice. This is the only time that I can ever say I actually heard God speak to me. The guidance was to spend more time with your kids, um, buy a condo, and get a life. I'm still working on get a life. But those directions just came, bam, 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 just, they just came. So I returned to my job as the administrative assistant to Reverend Mary Elmwake at Unity Church of Overland Park and to the condo that I rented from my BFF. This BFF, Sandy, was a mortgage loan officer, and so she went with me and we set out to find me the perfect condo because God told me to go buy a condo. The loan would get all worked out. You see, I had filed bankruptcy. I'd lost my house, my car, my business. And so that was kind of a detriment. But three times we got the loan okayed, and at the last minute the deal fell through. Three different condos. But both of us, we knew our unity principles, we followed our unity principles, and I just knew that's, that's not my condo. That's not the one for me. Well, at times, mail would kind of pile up during the week, and on Sunday afternoons I would open all of the mail. So I was opening mail in mid-August when I opened an offer from a timeshare in Branson. I had never before had the feeling that came over me. It felt like every hair on my whole body was just standing on end, and I kind of shuddered and went, Oh, my God, I am supposed to move to Branson. I took a deep breath and called my friend Sandy and said, you will never believe what God told me to do. And she said, oh, yes, I will. Tell me. 
So I said, I'm supposed to move to Branson. And I related the experience to her from opening the mail. And she agreed she'd go with me to Branson to check out things. And at one time, from 1968 to 1973, I lived in Crane. And I had babies in 68, 69, 71, and I was pregnant in 73 when we left Crane to move to Joplin. So while I was in Crane, we took the kids to Silver Dollar City a lot. And then when they were teenagers, I took them down to Canicut Camp in Branson. So Sandy and I went down to check out the job opportunities to um, find out what the rental situation was. And we went out to the Unity Church to meet the minister. Well, he was elated to have a licensed Unity teacher in his congregation. I went back to Overland Park. And then I received the call to interview at Shoji Kabuchi Theater. So the next time I went alone, interviewed and began to seriously look at places to rent if I would get the job. And I was called and offered the position of administrative assistant at Shoji Kabuchi Theater. So I really got serious about finding a place to live. Well, I was not having much luck because I had a dog and a cat. And, you know, renting, that isn't always appreciated. So I was sitting at a stoplight. I could still show you which stoplight in Branson. And I was really discouraged. And I looked up. You know how you can look up on a bluff in Branson? And there are signs up there. And this sign said that they had condos for rent or purchase, brand new, and they accepted pets. So, man, I just zoomed right over there. And the lady showed me a brand new condo, a lower level walkout, which is what I wanted because of the dog. And I told the woman, I'm really interested in renting, but I don't have first and last month's rent. So do you think maybe we could work something out? And she said, well, why don't you just buy it? Well, to me, that seemed a little ludicrous that I was going to buy something when I didn't have first and last month's rent, it stands to reason I probably didn't have a down payment. So we went back to the office and they offered to rent me this condo and they would take half of my rent every month and put it into um, what's it called? escrow account, an escrow account so that I'd have my down payment when the year was up. Well, I signed the papers for the lease purchase, returned to Overland Park, and over Labor Day, my first grandchild was born in Springfield. That's Sydney. And when she was three weeks old, I moved to Branson just six weeks from the time that I had been guided to move there. And let's digress. The way that the condo worked out, it didn't have, since I didn't have the required funds, um, it has to be an unfolding of God's guidance and divine order. Really, divine order always unfolds for our highest good. I could check off two of the three goals now. I would be spending more time with my children because at that time, all four of them lived in Springfield, and I had just bought a condo in Branson. I had been promised by the Shoji Tabuchi Theater that I would not be laid off you know, after Christmas and during the downtime. But guess what? I was. And because I had worked at a church previously, I had no unemployment and I had no income. None. So I went to work as a salesperson in a timeshare company. Seems a little synchronistic, doesn't it, from the letter that invited me. And I don't know which company invited me that caused me to realize I was supposed to move down there. So I went to work as a salesperson, and when my year rolled around, I couldn't get a loan because I hadn't had my job for a year. So I went to the, back to the sales office to tell them, if you want me to move out, I'd be happy to. Don't know what I'll do, but I will move out. They said, oh, no, no, no. We'll extend it six months, and then you'll need two months to get your loan. So they set a new date for the closure, eight months from when I was supposed to close. Thank you, God. That was a relief. 
And I was following God's guidance, and things were working out with the slimmest possible, probable circumstances. And I was grateful for it every day. So during my time in Branson, I was immersed in the activities at Unity of the Hills. Seven of the nine years I attended there, we didn't have a minister. So I'd either speak or arrange for someone to come speak. I also deposited the money and paid all the bills. I sold my condo and um, moved to the home I purchased in Nixa while I was still working in timeshare in Branson. I had changed companies and now as a verification offer, which is the person that goes over the paperwork once you've agreed to purchase. And I was director of the VLOs until I was demoted and a person that I had hired and trained uh, became the director. I now had six grandchildren and because I traveled to Branson every Sunday, I missed Delaney's third birthday party. Her birthday is August 7th and she is in the nursery taking care of the young kids. But I missed the cake, I missed the candles, I missed singing the song and seeing her blow them out, the candles, and open the presents and all that. I missed it, and I was heartbroken. And next month, in October or September, her brother Quinn was going to turn one month old. And I wasn't going to miss him diving into that cake. So what am I going to do? Hmm. Couldn't go to church in Branson. And so I had a divine idea. Why don't I check out that church in Springfield? Well, I went online to check the schedule for Christ Church Unity, now known as Unity of Springfield. And hallelujah, they had a service at 9.15. I could attend church. I could go home and change my clothes. I could get my present. And I could get to the party on time. I came into this building. And I was hugged by Norma Jean Milliken, which I bet a lot of us here were hugged by Norma Jean when we first came in. And I walked into the back of the sanctuary, and I was brought to tears then, too. I had felt like I had come home. I didn't feel that way when I first went to Unity. But when I walked in here, I knew I was home. It took me back to my first days at UCOP when we had a, a small church building and a a small congregation, and that's how I knew that I was home. I remember the first Sunday I was here, Sue jumped out of an airplane that week, and I was secretly hoping that that wasn't a requirement to attend here <laughs> or be a member. I had no intention of jumping out of an airplane. So I went back to Unity of the Hills and made a lot of arrangements and left as gracefully as I could. And I met with Sue and to see if I could hang my license here because a licensed teacher is usually um, connected with some church. So soon on my day off, I got a call from the young woman I had mentored. And she said, why don't you just go ahead and take Tuesday off? Hmm. Well, okay. I'll call you on Tuesday afternoon, she said. Well, when I got the call, Brandy was crying, and she couldn't even say anything. And I said, oh, no. Yes, she said, I have to let you go. And I didn't find out for several years that it wasn't just me. She had to let the entire department go. Well, I went into shock. I wasn't expecting to lose my job. I went into shock, I chilled, I shook, you know, um, hyperventilated. I didn't even call my family or my sister. I just couldn't even talk about it yet. And I might have drowned a few tears that night in a bottle of wine. But I kept waking up through the night, and my first thought, you know, when you're really upset how you wake up just every little bit, I would wake up, and every time I woke up, I would hear, I know the plans I have for you. And all things work together for good. Over and over. So I called Sue the next morning and, and talked with her and told her what had happened. Still hadn't told my children or my sister what had happened. 
And I told her about those two Bible verses that just kept coming back and kept waking me up all night long. And she prayed with me. And we shared the things we knew about unity, the teachings that had totally changed our lives, and we said goodbye. She called me back in less than an hour, and it was Wednesday. And she was looking at some things that she might do on the Wednesday night message that she was giving that night. The first words on the piece of paper were, I know the plans I have for you. And oh, so we hung up. And the next morning, I called her and I said, have you read the daily word today? And she said, no. And I said, the scripture is, Jeremiah 29, 11, I know the plans I have for you. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you future with hope. My friends, this is so true. And I wasn't singled out from all the rest to affirm God has a plan for me. God has a plan for all of us. And it's good, whatever it is. The only action I took on Tuesday night was I went online and started drawing unemployment. And at the time, there were a lot of people out of work. And so the government was paying 75% of your COBRA, which helped because I couldn't afford the insurance with no job at all. Um, and when my unemployment was about to come to a halt, I got a call from this church. And they asked me to come in and... Um, interview for the uh, position of administrative assistant, and it was very part-time. Well, the week after I was terminated, I went to the Social Security office, and I signed up for Social Security way before I ever thought I would. The good news, in November, I turned 65, and now I had Medicare, and my COBRA was running out. So early in 2010, that's when my unemployment was beginning to run out, and I got this call to come here to Christ Church Unity and interview for the administrative assistant position. Well, I was offered the position, and I began on February 1st. And it was really part-time, but that helped stretch my unemployment out. What little I had left could be stretched out over a longer time. And about October that year, the administrator quit, and I was moved to the position of, of administrator. Now, another episode of divine guidance that will probably bring me to tears saved my life. On Sunday, May 22nd, 2011, I taught my prosperity class here in Fellowship Hall, and then I left the building and drove to Miami, Oklahoma, to be there for my sister's surprise 60th birthday party. My plan was to go and be at the party, and I would leave about 6 p.m. to go back to Nixa. Well, the party was great. You know, the food was good. The company was good. They had a, a PowerPoint of her life, and we had memories and family and friends. And about 4 p.m., I stood up and said, I think I'd better go. Now, I'd planned to leave at 6, but this was 4, and I was determined I was going to leave. And, of course, they said, oh, no, we'll have some more food, we'll eat some more, and, we, you know, stay a little while longer. Nope, I need to leave now. And by 4.30, I was in the car, headed east on I-44. And I think you probably can fill in the rest of the story. I am so thankful I listened to my inner guidance, my wisdom, the gut feeling. It was time to go earlier than I planned, and I cut my, short, my visit short. But if I had found myself in that storm, I would have just kept driving. And why not? I was born and raised in northeast Oklahoma. I'd lived in Kansas, and I'd lived in Missouri, and no tornado had ever hit me yet. 
But if I had waited till 6 p.m., I would have been right in the middle of that tornado that killed many and demolished Joplin. My sister called me with the news. I was just south of Springfield on my way to Nixa, and she called me with what she had seen, the news on the television. Now, what is the message here? Listen, listen. I was not picked out from all the rest to be divinely guided. As I said it before, you too are divinely guided. Are you listening? When I am asked what instigated and supported the changes in my life from victim to victor, the answer is denials and affirmations. Reverend Dr. Michael Bernard Beckwith, he is an author and a spiritual leader at Beverly Hills, California. In, uh, he says that as we mature along the spiritual path, we move through four stages of consciousness. Stage one is victim consciousness, and I certainly started my unity life as a victim. Why are these things happening to me? And a power outside of our control is running our life, we think. Well, in stage two, as a manifester, you begin to take responsibility for your life and put the laws of the universe to work for you. Remember the first time you found the perfect parking place and you knew why? When we get to the third channel, we are the st third stage, we become a channel and we surrender to the will and to the higher intelligence that functions through us. And the fourth state of consciousness is being consciousness, where God manifests through us and we are somewhat enlightened. With habitual prayer and meditation, yes, it's a habit, just like the time of day we brush our teeth or take our medicine. Or I understand some people do exercise but with habitual practice of prayer and meditation, we can change our old thinking and life will look totally different. Prayer is not to change God. God is absolute, and that means God is unchangeable. And we will be more open to divine guidance if we do listen in meditation. Be open to messages and guidance because they can come in such strange ways, such as opening my mail and being overcome by knowing I was supposed to move to Branson when I'd never even had a thought cross my mind to move to Branson. It may come from something someone says, a billboard you see, a license plate. It may be a message from the platform. It may be a pulling like a magnet is drawing you in a new direction. And it may be discontent with the present experience that urges you to seek another answer. Your meditation time may be while you're walking around the block or going to the Y to walk or walking on one of our beautiful walkways here in Springfield. You can even meditate while you're fishing on the lake or one of our nearby rivers. Even not intentionally meditating, I get my best ideas when I'm in the shower. Guess I wash away the bad ideas and <laughs> get the new ideas. Um, so there's no strict rules for meditation. It's personal to each and every one of us. Start your meditation with five minutes or only three minutes. And then as you get comfortable with whatever time you started, increase it by a minute or two until you get comfortable with that. And then you just keep moving it up. Because if we try to jump in for a 30-minute meditation on the first day, we will likely become discouraged and we will think this stuff just doesn't work. When the old beliefs come up and bite you in the derriere, yes, I took ballet for many years. So if you get bit in the derriere, say, get thee behind me, Satan. Get thee behind me. And no, we don't believe that there's a presence out there such as Satan. But it's a good adamant way to throw off those old beliefs and the old belief systems. Let go of them. Are you listening? I said several times, God speaks to all of us. 
God guides us in ways that will direct us to our highest good. And if we follow the guidance, things will unfold in ways with an ease that we never even dreamed possible. Do I hear an amen? Thank you. Amen. <laughs> Yay! <laughs> in preparation for this message, I've done some soul searching. I think you do every time you write a service. And I feel like I'm sharing the, all of these messages from God. And that if I did that and shared all the things that worked so well, that I should share some of the things that haven't worked out so well. And I couldn't think of a single thing. But my next thought was, I wasn't listening. I wasn't being observant. How many did I miss? Probably multitudes. Because I wasn't expecting it. And I wasn't receptive to it. We need to be open, receptive, and responsive to the direction and the guidance that God supplies us with moment by moment. And no matter how far out of our comfort zone it falls, we need to pay attention, we need to listen and discern what's our next step, and then we need to take the next step, and then we need to take the next one and the next one. However, last week I had dinner with my daughter, and I was sharing all this about how I was going to talk, and she said, well, Mom... Didn't you know when you went to marry Paul, my second husband, that you were making a mistake? Oh, yes. <laughs> Heavens, yes, I knew. I almost backed out, had a horrible pit in my stomach. And, you know, once it, it kind of starts, it kind of takes on its own force, and it's now the day, and, you know, you're, the friends are coming, and the cake is baked, and, and all of that. So you feel like it's out of your control. You feel like it's too late to change your mind. If I had an excuse, it was because it was before I learned the unity principles and started to live the unity way of life. I did not know that that discomfort in my gut was God saying, you are making a horrible mistake. And it's big. I just thought it was my nerves. Well, I stuck it out for 15 months and I covered my losses, which were big and costly. Not only financially, but all four kids despised him. And they moved back to Springfield with their dad. It was a hard lesson, and it may be the reason I've been single for almost 40 years. I think when I begin to study unity, though, study new thought, that that phenomenally wrong decision I had previously made paved the way for me to be more open and aware of God's activity in my life and following the guidance, whether it was a bold voice, a simple knowing, a shudder, a gut feeling, whatever it was. And what I'm hoping to do is bring you awareness that guidance can appear in any form. Like I said, it could be a billboard, a license plate, uh, you know, dialogue on a TV show, a book title, a voice, a voice no one else hears a nudge, an urge, an intuition, an idea, and then having the willingness, willingness to take the first step in the direction of the inspiration. And that's how God's plan works for us. All things work together for good. And most of us have probably started on a path that we thought was what we were supposed to do, and we hit a brick wall, just right up against the brick wall, and we have more challenges than we think we can ever go around, over, or through. The signs for the detour are right there, right there before us. God doesn't play favorites. God did not pick me or only some of you out uh, of the rest to favor with guidance. That voice with a capital V the big voice within us, does not rant, it doesn't rave, it doesn't chide us, it doesn't blame us, it doesn't demean us, it doesn't criticize us. Instead, we will get the nudge or an idea out of the blue 
And as if it, have you ever wondered where it is out of the blue? Well, out of the blue, we get those ideas. God and only God. Only God can do what he can do. He, she, it can do through us, not for us. When our circumstances and our ideas come together in an unlikely way, the universe is reaching out to us to help through a coincidence. Wait a minute. I know there's no such thing as a coincidence. But what I'm getting at is it's part of God's plan through us. Coincidence is a signal that it's kind of in code, but the still small voice within you is speaking. And sometimes it's easier to decipher and sometimes it's rather puzzling. Just be on the lookout for the way that the pieces will fit together and trust. Now, the acronym I learned was totally rely upon spirit's timing. And Sue uses totally rely upon spirit's da-da. Myrtle Fillmore tells us in how to let God help you. Your mind receives from two sources, the universal mind of being, which has its outlet through your consciousness, and the intellectual activities of the individual mind about you, which have both conscious and subconscious phases of expression. Now, that which you receive from the mind of God is always good, always helpful, health-inspiring, peace-inspiring. That which you receive from the reports of your senses or minds of others may be true and helpful, or it may be false and harmful. Thank you, Myrtle. Whatever we're facing, whether it is a challenge in our finances, in our relationships, in our health, in our career, or any of the other things you can name off, whatever it is, that loving presence is available to guide each and every one of us to a greater life. Prayer will drown out the noise that drowns out the voice of God. Whether we sit in the silence or open ourselves to be aware of every hint, every message, every nudge, that message from within, it may not fit into the plans we had. It may come as a total shock. And it means a huge change in our lives. And it may also confirm that we have been moving in the right direction. So your home for work for this week is be open and listen, take action. I didn't know it was going to do this. I thought I didn't know how. But anyway, your homework, be open and listen, take action, watch it all unfold before you, and be grateful. And this homework is not for just this week. It is forever and ever. Amen. And thank you all. Thank you. <laughs> and it is now that time in our service when we can just pay back a tiny, tiny little token of the gratitude that we feel for for God's gifts, for the spiritual community and the work that it does inside these walls and outside these walls. So if you'll take your love offering in your hand, we will bless it with our affirmation. Divine love through me blesses and multiplies all that I have, all that I give, and all that I receive.